Concepts of Construction with Brannigan is, is, is an intense chapter. Uh, once we get through the objectives and all that good stuff, you start understanding one thing is that there's new technologies and techniques that are being used every day in, building in buildings in the fire service. The laws of physics still apply. Force of man and nature is, is just there. And we, we can't rely solely from fire ground experience. We have got to understand that differently how gravity really impacts us in the fire service. As we go through this lecture real quick, I'm going to go through these slides pretty quickly, but the biggest thing is I want you to read the chapter because you're going to have to understand what a def definition of a load is, what that means to you. At the same time, stress and strain, not only on uh, a building, but how much strain and elongation and de deformation can occur in a building. And especially more than anything, there's four different types of forces that are used in t today's fire service building construction and it remains constant in building construction, compression, tension, torsion, and shear. Shear, rather, excuse me. So the big thing is, is what's a dead load? A dead load basically is anything on a roof that's mounted down. Uh, any type of weight on the building itself that's permanently attached is, is what we call added dead load. The big thing is a live load. This is something the fire service for years have dealt with, mainly because when we do roof operations, guess what? We are part of that load on that roof. We are a live load. A live load is, you know, can be anything. Objects moving across a, a span of a structure on a roof, uh, you can have all types of issues regarding lo live loads because guess what? The roof calculation of, of how that roof was assembled doesn't always necessarily include everything regarding how a live load is. Live loads are also <clears throat> how much water you're putting on the building. In a structure fire, we add a lot of water, weight. Weight in a building uh, is like gravity. It's pushing down and it's going to push down for one reason only. Because guess what? It's a live load and water basically is uh, an extinguishing agent that we use extensively in the fire service because it's cheap. But more than anything else, <clears throat> a normal flat roof may not be able to sustain what you're dealing with. An impact load. A lot of you have seen this. Cars in the buildings. Uh, it's a good example. Every week we probably have somebody that has gone out there and put a car into a building. We also have airliners that run in the building. Impact loads are calculated loads of uh, the building will stand so much, but no one knows how the force or inertia going into the building is going to be and what's really going to happen there. And it gets to be quite a calculating risk. Um, one of the big things people don't understand is that there's a lot of modifications that are going on in the buildings right now that weren't designed to be put in. You know, when you start looking at security windows and ballots and increased stacking and uh, settings in the buildings, now you're increasing uh, loads to the building. Not only do they do become deadlines, dead loads, but at the same time, they're increased the, the loading of the building basically because of security reasons. So now you have heavier security windows, you have everything else that goes along with it, and it, it gets to be quite... Uh, Quite an unpredictable load on a building. Static or repeated loads are basically what they are. Static load remains constant like window glass. Repeated loads are applied intermittently. Good example of that is an elevator going up and down. That's a load in a building. It's calculated but it's constantly going up and down. Got wind loads. Wind loads are important. How many buildings are going up in your area right now that are four-story that are wood construction? Now the design says, oh, don't worry about it, it's lightweight construction, it's fine. But has a wind load been taken into the calculation of, of building that building? What bracing is being used to hold that building up? So you've got to look at the whole picture, not just a little bit. When people build garages today, they have to brace the garage for what they call a tornado bracing so that the, the roof doesn't automatically just lift off, that it's tied into the side walls of the building. And the big thing is, is that it resists any type of wind shear against the building and keeps the, the building intact. 
So you got to look at that's called hurricane bracing, not tornado bracing. But the biggest thing is, is you got to look at those wind loads. And the big problem with wind loads, more than anything else, it's constant. It's a constant. If you got to this recently, we just had 50 to 60 mile an hour winds. If a building wasn't calculated out for 70 to 80 mile an hour winds, then we would start seeing buildings blow over. So you've got to look at the low wind loads and the key factors that go with that. If you're riding on an engine company and you're going down the street and you see this tree flying down the street with you, uh, obviously the wind load is a lot worse than people think. And guess what? Now that tree becomes an impact load. So you got to look at all the key factors that go along with this. That's why we're revisiting Chapter 2 again. Chapter 2 is key to where you go next. Uh, you got to look at the key factors. Diaphragm floors are designed to stiffen against the wind. But the big thing is, is how stiff is the walls? And that's what you got to look at. Key loads and, and, and anything is mega structure, tube construction. That's part of what the tube and core construction was the World Trade Center. Then you have concentrated loads. You have loads that are probably built on one side of the building versus the other. And then the big thing you got with concentrated loads, are they calculated correctly to be there? A lot of things are added after the fact. And a concentrated load, quite frankly, a good example of a concentrated load is an air conditioning unit put on a roof. Concentrated in one spot. Is it calculated to be in that spot? Or is it just something they put up there and say, oh, it'll be all right. You know, you got your actual loads. The force that passes through the centroid of a section of a building. A good example is a basement I-beam set, being set up and you got a support column right in the middle of it all. That's an actual load. You got to look at the center and then the eccentric loading uh, of the building as well. So you got to look at how things are put together and how the building's put together. Next time you see a steel building go up and you just see the steel structure there, take a picture of it and then study it. And the reason why I say study it, because you'll see how the actual, load, actual loading of the building is, and you'll see the centroid and where that's at and how that's going to hold that building up. And then you start to understand how eccentric loading of the force of the building is perpendicular to the plane. So you start seeing how things kind of go together, how you're looking at the big picture here. Fire loads, we know what those are. Be careful with that. Okay. Suspend the loads, drop ceilings to suspend the load. Um, how many high rise buildings do you go in, or how many office buildings do you go in, or how many schools do you go in, and you got to suspend the load? Quite a few. The big thing is the safety. Safety factor is in regards to how everything is calculated. If you don't look at the safety factor, and if you look at a set of blueprints, and the safety factor says one to one, or two to one, or three to one, Start understanding when they mean three to one, what's that entail? So you got to look at all those things. You got composite materials, how concrete's put together, how it's laced with rebar, how it's put together as far as a cage type construction so that you can pour concrete over the top of it so that it can support the uh, a floor or whatever they're building. Structure components are, are key uh, when you start looking at frames. And you start looking at beams and arches and columns. Columns and beams hold the building up. I don't know what else I can tell you. That's as simple as that. Beams transfer, transfer, transfer the force from one end to the other. There's deflection and there's a neutral axis of the beam and there's stiffness. Think about this. If the beam is four inches long, it can hold pretty much anything you want as far as weight wise. But the longer the span is, the less it will hold. But it all depends on how thick the beam is. So if you only have a 4-inch beam and it goes 102 millimeters, you're only going to hold 533 pounds. But however, if you've got a 16-inch beam and you're going to go 6 feet, it's going to hold 8,500 pounds. So the same thing with the 4-inch beam. If you go 6 foot, you're only at 533. But if you're at a uh, 16-inch thick beam at 5, uh, it's going 16 feet, you're at 85.33 as far as the weight load. Look at it from the standpoint. The thicker the beam, the more the load. Cables. I don't know what else I can tell you. Look at the cable chart in the book, uh, table 2.1. It'll give you the loading of a cable and what that does at that point. 
capacity and depth as part of this, the, the book as far as your uh, PowerPoint in the book so that just just look closely with this this is just a glossary overview of what we're going to look at here's a good example of a beam a lintel that's across the top of this window but you can see how the water along this uh, particular slide has eradicated the support of the building <clears throat> of course there's types of beams that you got to look at beam loading this is a, this is a shot probably of the mural off mural office building in oklahoma city on a blew up <clears throat> reaction and bending that was all part of that trusses trusses we're going to talk a lot about trusses again and then as you start looking at the various trusses you will build a truss in this class and when you build a truss in this class look at what that truss is going to do and what's the most common truss you're going to see more than likely you'll see the king post truss more than anything else or the inverted king post truss compression compression and tension the top cord to the bottom cord cantilevering uh, principles of the truss and then the problems with trusses and Brannigan always talks, talks to you so well is uh, Vincent Dunn who says don't trust the trust he's right don't trust the trust <clears throat> trust failures columns all these are items that you need to understand as you incorporate them in your papers I beam versus the H beam it's real important and the big thing is types of columns are out there <coughs> excuse me Euler's, Euler's law is this formula that you see here you'll see that on down the road and that gives you the what a column will basically be able to support that's the formula they use in construction methodology So you're looking at the bracing, you're looking at how the column is longer and how it will carry the load. All important things. Temporary bracing, walls, um, cantilever walls, what you see here. Those are the type of now you see and what they call pre. You see these type of walls in precast construction now. You'll see these are large. Uh, Warehouses are go up, and when they put these up, these winds are uh, can topple very quickly because of, uh, of basically no support. So you have a centric loading of this, and then they use the torsional bars to hold everything up. Um, breaching of the wall is 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 a whole object uh, topic of itself, but the, then you have your roof structures. Gives you various type of roofs here. That's really important to you. Your arches, your frames, your shells and domes, which we're seeing more of an architectural uh, dome mentality, mythology right now on what you see arches and buildings going up. Foundations, connections, how buildings are put together. Connections are important, how they're pinned. Rigid frame buildings, how they're put together. Here's a wood building We're using lightweight uh, joints. Uh, these are all, uh, the best way I can tell you is they're just lightweight stamped metal. And then this is how they put a floor system together. <clears throat> how these fail under fire conditions. And the other part of this thing is, is what causes these failures. This is a fire cut that they used to use years ago. You see that in old mill construction. Um, overhangs and drop beams are important. Then you have your splice beams, how they splice two beams together. And basically, then you get into the summary of the chapter. I'm going to load this into the assignments tonight. That way you've got it to go through. And I think you'll understand where I'm going. So thank you all, and be, uh, be, be a good student and read Chapter 2 thoroughly. Thank you.